Greetings, bookworms, and welcome to the Bearded Book Club's production of The Glass Magician by Charlie N. Holmberg. If you want to follow along in this and all of our productions, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications so that you will be notified of all new videos as well as when we do our live shows. If you would like to support BBC, you can do so in two ways, both of which are listed in this video's description. One, you can become a patron and support us on a regular basis. Or two, you can go to our Amazon wish list and send us a book as a one-time donation. So, without further ado, let us continue. The Glass Magician, Chapter 4 Sienny lay awake in her bed, her arms splayed across her forehead to keep the morning sunlight from her eyes. Fennel whined at her from the door, his paper tail beating a rapid rhythm against the carpet. She reached a hand toward him and struck the top of his paper head. In her mind, she stood in front of the paper mill's three buildings, the shuttle driving away down the pebbled road behind her. Miss Johnston mumbled ahead of her. Sienny strained her memory for any forgotten details that might explain what had happened. She wished she'd paid more attention, but the police had said the explosion happened in the drying room, of all places, and Sienny's tour never reached that part of the mill. That's why the police suspected sabotage. There was nothing in the drying room that could have malfunctioned on such a large scale. Sienny recalled the intense heat on her face as the fire soared toward the sky. She could only imagine how much hotter it must have been inside. By the time she and Emery had left the police station, 14 casualties had already been reported. Sienny had read the list. No one with the surname Johnston had been on it. Closing her eyes, Sienny replayed the explosion, the fire, the falling rubble. Thank goodness for Clemson, whose pyre magic had saved her life. No paper spell could have rescued her from being crushed. But she hadn't included the falling rubble in her police report. Emery had been listening, and she hadn't wanted to distress him. He had been so... Quiet. Worried about her. Sienny had been too shaken to relish the way he'd held her. Sienny sat up and straightened the bodice of her nightgown, then moved to her desk, which sat on the opposite side of the small bedroom. In the back of the second drawer rested the fortuity box that had offered her such pleasant promises for the future. She held it for a long moment before returning it to its hiding spot. It was bad luck to read one's own fortune, and Sienny had experienced her fill of bad luck for the week. Fennel coughed a faint bark and wagged his tail. Moments later, Sienny detected the smell of bacon wafting under the door. Had Emery decided to cook breakfast? She glanced at her clock. Ten past nine. She'd slept in late today. Quickly changing into a blouse, skirt, and a pair of stockings, Sienny went to the bathroom to brush her teeth, braid her hair, and apply her makeup. She hurried down the steep stairs that opened onto the dining room, where Emery had already loaded two plates with bacon and eggs. "'You didn't have to do this. I was up,' Sienny said, though it impressed her that the bacon wasn't burned, and the eggs looked perfectly sunny. Ever since being fed tuna and rice on her first day as an apprentice, Sienny had insisted on cooking every meal. After all, if not for Emery's scholarship, she would have enrolled in culinary school. I am capable of cooking, Emery said, pulling out a chair for her. Else I would have starved long ago. Sienny smiled and settled into the seat while Emery retrieved silverware. Perhaps he had needed to cook while married to Lyra. The excisioner didn't seem like she'd be much of a cook, though Sienny wouldn't dream of asking him about it. If any topic made Emery uncomfortable, it was his ex-wife. Sienny wondered if Lyra was still as she'd left her, frozen and bleeding on the rocky beach of Falness Island. But then Emery sat down beside her and the memories flitted away. He handed her a telegram. What's this? she asked, unfolding it. Let's not change plans. Stop. Albans at noon. Stop. 
It came this morning, Emery said between bites. He frowned at his eggs and reached for the pepper shaker. I believe it's from Delilah, unless you've taken to arranging social visits with Patrice Avioski. His eyes shined as he chuckled at his own joke. I would like to meet her for lunch, Sienny said, unless you need me here. Emery thought for a moment, chewing, and left the table without excuse. He returned with a 9 by 14 sheet of paper, which he tore in half. Mimic, he told it, a spell unfamiliar to Sienny. He then haphazardly folded one half into quarters and handed it to Sienny. Anything you write on this will appear on my copy, he explained in an unusually protective tone. That way, if you need anything, well, it's self-explanatory. Sienny turned the spell over in her hands. You've never sent me out with one of these before. One can never be too irrational. Don't be too long. There is plenty of homework to do. After breakfast, Sienny headed back to her room. As she packed her purse with the mimic spell and some sparse paper, she couldn't help but feel uneasy about her situation. Three months ago, she had confessed her love for Emery while quite literally trapped in the fourth chamber of his heart. He still had not directly addressed her confession. He avoided uncomfortable subjects as a general rule, so perhaps the confession had made him uncomfortable. Sienny's cheeks burned at the thought. When she'd said the words, she hadn't believed he would remember them upon waking. And Sienny still couldn't forget Lyra's cruel laughter. He doesn't love you, she'd said. Her gaze drifted again to the second drawer in her desk. What if the fortuity box had only shown her what she wanted to see, and not the truth? What if she had already done something to upset that possibility of future events, leaving her longing for something that was no longer an option? She sighed. She had only been in one previous relationship, in secondary school, and that had been much easier than this. Perhaps she should take that as a sign and give up. Yet she couldn't give up on Emery. She knew that more surely than anything. She loved him. She loved his genuineness, his honesty, his cleverness, his humor and eccentricity. She loved the way his hands moved when he folded, and the way he pursed his lips when concentrating. She loved his kindness. At least, he was always kind to her. She imagined a great number of people felt scorned by Emery Thane, or they would if they were sharp enough to notice when he mocked them. He had a very subtle way of insulting people. Still, she wished she hadn't fallen for him as quickly as she had. She took her safety bicycle, complete with enchanted tires that wouldn't wear, into town. She had purchased it one month into her apprenticeship after growing weary of waiting for buggies and spending large chunks of her stipend on transportation. It made for a much longer ride, but the road into the city was a peaceful one, so Sienny didn't mind. She just made sure to stay on the far side of the street, away from the narrow river running alongside it. She found Delilah waiting outside St. Albans Salmon Bistro a small red brick shop with chocolate-covered window molds and a worn oval sign over the window that bore a weathered blue fish. Delilah looked like her normal chipper self. She waved broadly as Sienny parked her bicycle. "'How are you feeling?' Sienny asked once they had been seated at a small oak table near the center of the half-filled restaurant. A few couples and a family occupied the booths to their left and right, the scent of cooking fish wafted through the air. The sound of clinking dishes percussed from the kitchen. Sienny tucked her purse under the table near her feet. Oh, Sienny, wasn't it just awful? Delilah said as she glanced over the menu. Her eyes lingered for a moment before she set it down. I kept waking up last night. Magician Avioski canceled all her appointments this morning and headed back to Dartford. She's all rung up. Worse than usual. Says she can't sit by while students are in danger. 
They're not still in danger, are they? Sienny asked, hair follicles prickling. Delilah shook her head. Well, no. We're all fine, she said as the waiter brought their water. The others went to a different station, is all. I don't know more than that. But I was so embarrassed. I have a spinning head, you know. I wish I could stay calm like you. Sienny laughed. I don't think anyone's described me as calm before. She paused. I don't know. I'm, I suppose after you see so much, the extraordinary starts to become more ordinary. Have you seen so many extraordinary things? Delilah asked, leaning forward. Do tell. I hope they're romantic. Sienny blushed. Not entirely. And perhaps I'll tell you when we're alone. She didn't think it wise to recount her excision or escapades in a crowded restaurant, especially since Magician Avioski knew very little of what had actually happened with Lyra, short of what Emery had shared with criminal affairs. As for Emery, she'd keep that to herself. The waiter carried a small basket of bannock to their table and took their order. Delilah requested fish and chips, and Sienny asked for crab bisque. Afterward, Delilah stuck her head into the large cloth bag that she had brought with her. She muttered something and then resurfaced with a compact makeup mirror. It was a beautiful object. A silver Celtic knot was welded onto the top, and a seashell-shaped clasp kept it closed. Extraordinary like this? she asked. Raising her eyebrows, Sienny accepted the mirror and opened it. Only instead of the reflection of her face, the dark eyes of a gorilla blinked back at her. Sienny shrieked and dropped the mirror. Delilah laughed and scooped it off the table. How did you do that? Sienny asked. It's a choice reflection spell, she explained. You can make the mirror reflect whatever you picture in your head. With just a command, Sienny mumbled, thinking of Delilah's covert whispering. She studied the compact in Delilah's hands. There were very few spells Sienny could merely dictate to a piece of paper. Folding required just that. Folds, preparation, foresight, manipulation with creases and cuts. Gaffing, or glass magic, was the second quickest after fire magic. Smelting or enchanting metal alloys was the slowest. Sienny tapped her fingers on the table. It's like story illusion. Delilah frowned. Um, yes? I'm not sure what that is. But you face the mirror. Delilah opened the compact and gazed into it. And say, choice reflection. And think of exactly what you want or don't want, to see. She repeated the spell, closed her eyes, and showed Sienny the mirror again. This time Sienny wasn't even in the reflection. Instead, she could see the broad-shouldered man who sat alone by the window behind her. Clearly interested in their conversation, he craned his head for a better look. Delilah canceled the spell, snapped the mirror shut, and held it out to her. A late birthday gift for you. Sorry I didn't wrap it, but I thought the trick would be fun. Sienny's lips parted as she looked at the mirror. Oh, Delilah, it's so pretty. You didn't have to... Take it, take it, she laughed, shaking the compact at her. Sienny took it with a smile and traced the Celtic ornament with her fingers as she slipped it into her purse. Thank you. My birthday is in December, Delilah said matter-of-factly. Don't forget. December 11th, Sienny said. I won't. Seeming content, Delilah relaxed into her chair, took a sip of water, and said, Sienny, are you in love? Sienny, who had also taken a sip of water, sputtered as she struggled to swallow it. Wh what? You just have this faraway, airy look lately, like on the shuttle and on your bike. You mean the way you look when you're around Dover? Sienny teased. Delilah stuck out her tongue. I think he likes me. 
At least he went out of his way to send me a paper dove after the dreadful thing with the mill. He's two years younger, but he doesn't look younger. That's all that really matters. Their meals arrived, and between bites the two of them chatted about the paper mill, Sienny's paper doll and the new feather fashion in women's hats. When Big Ben, north of Parliament Square, chimed one thirty, Delilah snatched up her paper napkin and dabbed her lips. "'I'm so sorry, Sienny,' she said, "'but I told Magician Aviaski I'd attend a glass-blowing appointment on her behalf at two, since she's in Dartford. You'll forgive me?' Sienny waved a hand. "'It's fine. I need to head back, too.' Delilah circled the table and kissed both of Sienny's cheeks. Let's do it again sometime. She dropped a few shillings on the table and hurried out the front door. Tilting her bowl, Sienny scraped out the last of her bisque, but the chair across from her rattled before she could bring the spoon to her lips. A broad-shouldered man sat down in the seat Delilah had just vacated. Sienny recognized him as the person she'd seen in the mirror. She lowered her bowl. Something about the man seemed familiar, but Sienny had a hard time pinpointing what. He looked to be in his early forties, with a well-built form and light, almost ginger-colored hair. Narrow, expressionless gray eyes watched her beneath thick eyebrows and a creased forehead. "'Can I help you?' Sienny asked. The faintest grin spread just above his broad chin. Sienny's breath caught as her memory settled. She knew that chin. The nose looked wrong, a fake. But she remembered that chin. Those eyes. She had seen them on a wanted poster at the post office. She had watched them lurk behind bars in the second chamber of Emery's heart. She had seen this man in the distance as she stood on the shore of Falness Island. Her mouth went dry and her tongue hardened to a brick in her mouth. She gripped her napkin, her paper napkin. Mind spinning, she managed to say, You're Grath Cobalt. The most renowned excisioner in England, if not all of Europe. She tried to slide her chair back. She couldn't let him touch her but Grath hooked his foot around its front left leg. No one in the restaurant noticed anything out of the ordinary. Not as far as Sienny could tell. She dared to glance at the main entrance to the restaurant, then to the back door behind her and to the left. What would he do if she screamed? He sat so close. And it would only take one touch for his spell. She smoothed her napkin in her lap keeping her eyes on Grath as she formed a half-point fold. "'I'm impressed you recognize me,' Grath said with a lopsided smirk. His long canines made him look like a cat. "'Smart girl.' "'Posters of you are everywhere,' Sienny replied, trying to sound nonchalant. She glanced at the waiter three tables over. Grath yanked her chair forward. Eyes on me, sweetheart. Let's get this chat out of the way. I have places to go. Sienny drew in a shaky breath and carefully maneuvered her clammy fingers over her lap. Full point fold. Duck fold. It took a while to track you down, Grath said, playing with Delilah's fork. It looks so tiny in his giant hands. All I knew to look for was a red-headed girl with strange magic. And you turned out to be Emery Thane's apprentice, of all people. How is the bugger? Still kicking, I hear. Sienny said nothing. She kept her gaze fixed on Grath's cool stare. Grath chuckled, but his smile vanished too soon. He leaned forward, dangerously close. I want you to tell me what you did to Lyra. Adrenaline made Sienny's skin prickle. I I didn't do anything. Grath slammed his fist on the table, 
rattling the dishes and earning a few curious looks from other patrons. It took all Sienny's willpower not to jump. You're not in any position to lie to me, Sienny, my twill. What strange sorcery did you cast on her? I did nothing strange, she lied. Four corner folds, and she flipped the napkin over. I'm a folder, that's all. What spell? Sienny sucked in a long breath, fingers prodding the napkin to check its alignment. I won't tell you, she whispered. The world is better off without her. The sooner... Grath jerked her chair to the left. Sienny winced, but made her last fold without flinching. You think I care about the people here? He growled, barely above a whisper. You think I care if they have to watch me slice the skin from your bones? They're cowards, Sienny. They'll run the minute blood spills, and I will spill all of it drop by drop until you tell me what I want to know. Or maybe I'll start with them, he said, cocking his head toward a family of four in the corner. They had an adolescent girl and a young boy with them. Do you know how strong a child's heart is, Sienny? The sort of spells I could cast with that one? Sienny shut her eyes for a moment. Too many memories, things she wished she could unsee, came flooding up at those words. The gaping hole in Emery's chest as he collapsed to the floor, his heart clutched in Lyra's hands. The pressure of the bloody, sweltering walls of Emery's heart pressing against her on all sides. The sight of harvested corpses strewn across the floor of a warehouse storage room. She coaxed them down, burying them deep within her mind. Hatton Delilah just called her calm. Be calm, she pleaded to herself. All right, she said careful. You want to know how I froze Lyra? Grath knit his fingers under his chin, waiting. Sienny drew another deep breath. It started with this. She dropped the rhombus-shaped napkin in the middle of the table and whispered, Burst! The napkin began to vibrate rapidly. First, Grath looked confused. Then his eyes widened. In one movement, Sienny twisted her chair away from the excisioner's foot and leapt from the table, bolting for the back door. The burst spell exploded. The explosion wasn't as strong as when Sienny had used the spell against Lyra, since this one had been made with the thin napkin paper, but it was large enough to send dishes flying and chunks of table scattering, large enough to burn anyone who came too close, even an excisioner like Grath. Sienny didn't survey the damage. She slammed her body into the back wall and bolted into the sunlit street. She sprinted across the road, earning an angry yell from a driver, and took a sharp corner around a bank and out of Parliament Square. Her heart raced with her legs as she rushed down one street and dodged between a hotel and a rug shop, jumping over a busted curb. Distance. She needed to get as far away from Grath as she could, put as many things between them as possible. Emery! She reached for the mimic spell, only to realize she'd left it at the restaurant, along with her purse, mirror, and bike. She had no way to contact him. Delilah! But which glass blower had she gone to? She could be anywhere by now. Sienny paused at an intersection between a single-story pet supply store and a two-story antique shop, panting, peering through the mass of people who were blissfully unaware of the danger in their midst. Graf didn't care about people. He had said as much. She needed to get away from the crowd. She heard shouts behind her and ran to the right, nearly knocking over a man laden with groceries. Her lungs began to burn as she pushed past him and kept running. Avioski! Magician Avioski lives in the city. If Sienny could round the next block and make it over the bridge, perhaps she could reach... She took another sharp right and collided into something solid. A huge man in a brown vest and brown trousers. The impact sent her toppling backward. She landed flat on her rump. Stars filled her eyes. Miss, the man exclaimed, are you all right? 
I'm terribly sorry. Here, let me help you up. He extended his thick hand, which was even bigger than Grath's. Sienny clasped it, and the man pulled her up so swiftly her vision swam. Thank you, she mumbled between breaths as the world settled back into place. She blinked at the man before her. He appeared to be in his late twenties and would have looked rather portly if not for his height. His mousy brown hair had been well oiled and slick to one side, and his brown eyes... See, and he recognized him. I... Langston! The man looked surprised. Have we met? They hadn't. Not really. But see, and he knew Langston, Emery's first apprentice, from the first chamber of Emery's heart. Langston had helped Emery build Jonto. And though he had more girth than muscle, he was about twice Grath's size. My name is Sienny, she rushed. I'm Magician Thane's apprentice, and I'm incredibly lost. Please, please, can you help me get home? Langston blinked several times, clearly confused by this turn of events, but nodded. Of course. I have an auto park just a few streets down. It won't be a problem. My meeting was canceled anyway. Langston offered his arm, which Sienny gratefully and desperately accepted. As they walked, she dared to spy over her shoulder, but she saw no sign of Grath Cobalt behind her.